Okay, welcome to the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice webinar series. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I am an extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. I am the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice at uh, eExtension, which is the electronic version of the uh, Cooperative Extension Service uh, online. Uh, and as such, I am in charge of organizing the webinars that we have. Uh, this webinar is a special webinar that um, we're going to put on. There's been a lot of interest lately in the use of the black soldier fly larva. And our speaker, Dr. Ann Fanatico from Appalachian State University, has considerable experience in this area. And so we'll be giving uh, an overview of some of her work that she's done um, on her farm uh, in North Carolina. So uh, as I said, if you have a question, put it in the, the Q&A or the chat. I will be monitoring the questions um, so that Anne can, can do the presentation. So uh, it's all yours, Anne. I will be on mute and stop my video uh, until a question comes up. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Jackie. And I am excited to talk to folks today about black soldier fly larvae production for ecological poultry feed. And we will talk more today about own farm production, which tends to be small scale rather than large scale production. But we will, uh, I will make a few points about large scale production. Again, my name's Anne Fanatico. Uh, my email to contact me will be on the last slide in case you'd like to get in contact. I do teach in the Sustainable Development Department at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. We're in Western North Carolina. And I teach agroecology and I also do research on ecological poultry production, on, um, usually in a pasture poultry type setting. I would like to discuss what ecological poultry production, um, make some points about it before I start the discussion of black soldier fly larvae. One thing I want to mention about ecological poultry production is that it does follow principles in nature, meaning nutrient cycling, uh, obviously effective solar capture of solar energy by plants, biodiversity, uh, following principles that work in natural ecosystems, but also agroecosystems. It is often on a small scale, but larger scale where human populations are denser. And I've put a couple of photos up here from research units where I've worked. Uh, there's many different types of small scale, large scale, and mid scale production systems, but I did want to show uh, this one at App State University. This is actually where I do my research now, integrated with, um, with cattle pasture. These are portable pens. And then this is the um, USDA ARS Organic Poultry Research Facility in Fayetteville, Arkansas. This is an example of larger scale production. This is a 100 foot house and with pop holes to uh, provide access to the outdoors, um, but with rotation of the pasture in order to provide uh, fresh pasture to the birds. Just a few things about um, poultry and their protein requirements. Uh, when we raise poultry in any manner, ecological, conventional, it's important to keep in mind that they do have high protein requirements. So I've just put up the protein requirements, or actually the nutrient requirements of poultry from the NRC, uh, including uh, meat chickens that, uh, as you probably know, broilers are started at a very high level of protein, reducing it as they age. Turkeys in particular have an extremely high uh, protein requirement when they're poults. And then the protein requirements for, this is in the case of uh, brown egg layers, the, the pullet to laying hen age. All 
having a little bit of trouble advancing the slides. That's why um, they're kind of racing forward and I have to go back, but I think I'm getting the hang of it. Um, I do want to mention a few things about organic poultry production as we get started, that especially in organic production, high quality protein feeds are needed, especially since a number of things are not permitted. Synthetic amino acids are generally not permitted in organic livestock production. With the exception with our USDA program, the National Organic Program, there is a small amount of methionine that's uh, still allowed just with poultry production. But there's no uh, slaughter byproducts allowed for feed in organic production, no, no meat and bone meal, and then no uh, chemically defatted oilseed meals like the soybean meal that's been treated with hexane. So I hope that points out um, in ecological production and especially organic production, uh, we do need to look at alternative and innovative protein sources. One important protein source in ecological poultry feeding and organic is fish meal. And it is actually a, an excellent source of protein, about 68% crude protein and almost 2% uh, methionine. But there are sustainability concerns uh, related to overfishing using fish. And therefore, alternatives do include harvest of invasive fish, fish that are invasive to particular areas. For example, uh, the silver carp, actually big head carp is um, the more accurate name in the U.S. Midwest, that actually um, harvesting them can be a method of controlling or reducing an invasive species. And we have been working with um, University of Arkansas and USDA group in, um, in Arkansas um, on a project to uh, investigate the use of big head carp in dry extrusion, um, investigating it as a source of poultry feed. Um, obviously, the hope is that the, uh, this type of fish, invasive fish, will be controlled, and therefore it's important to look at additional sources of organic and ecological poultry feeds. And that's what brings me to invertebrates for poultry feed, for poultry protein. It's a very important alternative to fish meal. Um, in insects can often be raised on crop residue or food waste, insects and worms. And I would like um, to mention the red wiggler, Isenia fetida, does have a very high proportion of crude protein. This is an image here of um, production actually in, in Mexico. Um, raising these worms um, on a, this is actually on uh, sheep manure, uh, raising the worms and then it does produce a very valuable vermicompost soil amendment, um, very useful to increase organic matter with crop production and uh, many of the trace minerals. Insect production is definitely growing for poultry feed. I think there's uh, a lot of interest in mealworms. This is an image of, of mealworms being raised for feed. And I don't have an image of crickets, but that's another important insect feed. And it, it's interesting to think about insects and worms too as actually being uh, more natural feedstuffs for poultry compared to the fish meal. And that does bring us to a discussion of black soldier fly larva production, the um, Mesia elucens, that has high crude protein and again is also uh, fairly high in uh, methionine. Uh, some of these invertebrate proteins, fish meal too, can provide alternative sources of intact natural methionine. A background that I want to give as we get started discussing black soldier fly larvae is that they do have the ability to bioconvert organic waste into a high quality protein via their larva production. They are common to the Southeast US, but they are found around the world. And they're not nuisance flies. They don't bite, sting, or cause uh, problematic odors. 
Uh, this is an image uh, from online. I like the image because it does show um, these larvae are, uh, for those of you that are, are raising them now, you probably know how active they can be when they're feeding. Once they um, start turning black, once they start turning into pre-pupae, uh, they don't actually feed. But I like this image because it, it shows how active they can be. This is an image that I took from online from the, the protopodusa.com website. And it will be another resource that I list in resources at the end. Uh, but an important thing to know about the black soldier fly life cycle is that they, of course, produce a lot of eggs when the female lays. They hatch in about four days. And then there are several larval stages, about six instars that they pass through. And if you're raising these larvae, especially in batch production, I think you can really notice how they leave their, um, their former shells. They leave them behind. And that's a, um, a big part that you see in, in the frass is um, these discarded shells. And then they uh, do develop into the, from the, um, from the larva stage into a, a pre-pupil stage and a pupil stage where they do, <clears throat> they migrate and they find a dry sheltered place to pupate and turn into a, an adult, which is only alive for a few days. It, it, again, it doesn't, even the adult doesn't feed. All it really does is breed and then lay eggs. It's important to keep in mind new regulations that have um, had a, a a strong impact in the U.S. in the past year. It was uh, very good news to many insect producers that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration recommended to the Association of American Feed Control officials to include black soldier fly larvae as a poultry feed. In the past few years, it um, has really only been uh, legal, only been included in uh, feed control uh, to feed the larvae um, in aquaculture to fish. So it's very exciting that now um, black soldier fly larvae can, the feed can enter commerce and, and be on the market. And this has had an impact on large scale production. I just want to mention a few things about large scale production that there are several companies. Um, one actually may be close to, to you, Jackie, I'm not sure. It's um, based in Kentucky or Ohio. And this is, um, I've got to think a minute for the name, um, Symptom is, um, is based uh, um, in the U.S. And this is just an image from the um, internet that shows how large the production systems can be. Uh, this is one from Canada. Um, Canada was um, was sooner to allow black soldier fly larvae as a as a poultry feed, so they they've got a, a head start here. Um, this is in Terra, in in Canada, and this shows their insectarium, and they they do raise a lot of larvae, and it's on the market as a poultry feed and also aquaculture. These are feed grade stocks that are being used, and that is an important part of our definition um, from the. Association of American Feed Control Officials that it does need to be feed grade. So uh, this is pre-consumer and you can see a lot of vegetable material here and a few other cartons that are being emptied out. Again, this is uh, another image from the internet that shows the insectarium um, at Intera in Canada. What I wanna focus on in this discussion, however, is own farm black soldier fly larvae production, as uh, this is a way to increase nutrient cycling on, um, on farms and using uh, crop residue, using uh, food waste on farms and raise your own black soldier fly larvae. So it does tend to be on a small scale, but it could certainly be a mid scale or larger. And generally it's a continuous colony production um, meaning that the larva and adults, you know, the entire life cycle is going to be represented here, often using specialized units. Um, these are images of the two units that I use um, in the Sustainable Development Program. SD is what I often call our Sustainable Development Department. 
at Appalachian State University, and I often do call that App State. Um, so this is a small unit, the biopod, where you raise the larvae here, and this is the ramp that they use um, to migrate when they're ready to, to pupate, and they, they can do some self-harvest. We'll discuss that a bit more about um, the migration that the lar well, the prepupae do. Here's an opening where they drop into this collection bin. So this is a nice small scale unit. This is um, a larger one that's offered by Protopod. And this one, uh, this one costs about $100 in the US. This one's more like $300 to buy this type of molded plastic tub. But it is um, a really nice production unit. You can see the, um, the ramp is um, a molded part of the, the unit. This is where the um, larvae, the prepupae, climb, and then here's the vertical drop and opening that they fall through here. I've added um, a collection bucket. You can see that we produce these larvae in an outside setting in warm weather, and we have to be really prepared for the varmints, um, skunk, possum that, that might arrive, raccoons. So we do cover our unit. We have a, um, this is wood on top, and we have a few wood blocks that help support it. And then we do have a screen that goes all the way around, but the screen's large enough for the adults to fly in and out of. And then we do keep this in our compost area. It's, it's protected. So this is a way that, um, that many producers increasingly can grow black soldier fly larvae on their farm for chicken production, for chicken feed. And what I wanna show in this image is the many different types of homemade bins uh, that people make. Uh, as we start talking about designs, I do want to point out that if you're using wood that is subject to rot, a lot of people use different types of plastic tubs. And here's a guttering system that um, collects the larvae. Um, gutters are often used um, to collect the larvae. I like this system here, the image uh, that I pulled off the internet that shows um, you can adapt many different types of plastic bins um, or other types of bins. You know, here it shows some um, probably PVC, you know, I think PEX would also work uh, where the mig where the pupae can migrate up here and then fall into a drop. I like this image from the internet here that shows how you can actually have the larvae, the prepupae fall directly into a, a feed trough. You can see right here, the prepupae would be climbing up this ramp here and then they do fall right into a feeder for the, so they probably never see their black soldier fly larvae because the, the chickens are waiting for them. If you're interested in attracting native black soldier fly larvae, they are, again found in many parts of the world. Um, here in the US, they um, are found pretty much um, heat zone six and higher. Uh, we are in um, zone 6B here in Western North Carolina. We're in the high country and we, we do get some very cold weather. Um, I'd say in, in zone five, what I've read is that they tend to be more sporadic. So in this part of the world, in temperate areas, um, it's a bit of a challenge to keep something like this going, you know, uh, year round. In fact, you have to have a, a winter time um, production system if you want to try to do this year round um, in temperate areas. But the way in, in our area that we attract adult females for egg laying is, you know, set out. Uh, this is a, a new bin that I had set up a few years ago under a covered area and set out uh, very rich food scrap or food waste. And what's commonly recommended in the, the protopod instruction manual, which again, I'll, I'll list as a resource at the end, is to soak some dog food, you know, that it's rich enough that it will attract uh, females for egg laying. When you try to attract a natural population though, you're gonna first attract probably fruit flies and house flies, which are a nuisance before the black soldier fly 
colony becomes established. So we have to put up with um, some, some nuisance species usually. And once the black soldier fly larvae take over, um, they, they tend to be dominant. Um, this is, I was uh, actually trying to start a colony last summer and, um, uh, after the warm weather set in and it was on campus and I just wasn't visiting campus as much in the summertime and had trouble getting that colony started. But then I noticed in our compost tower, this is a black uh, plastic compost tower here in our university, just a small scale composting center. I noticed a few months later that there was a very rich population of um, black soldier fly larvae at the bottom of this compost tower where students have been putting in food scraps. So I just wanna mention that it, it can be, um, it can take a while to attract the um, adults native and I often just I don't want to wait you know I'm and once the warm weather starts I'm really ready to have a colony. Um, I do want to mention a few things about harvest that again there is a self-harvest component that the pre-pupae um, once they're ready to pupate that mouse part is modified as a hook and they never they don't they no longer feed. This is when they begin to migrate upwards away from their food source towards a, a dry sheltered pupation site. And they do develop a dark mineralized exoskeleton that's uh, high in calcium. The migration behavior can be used for self-harvest. And as you can see here, and I, I can't say how far they'll migrate, but this is a, a pretty long ramp. And so they'll climb this ramp and then fall into the, the collection bucket. Ramps up to 40% um, are generally recommended, you know, not, not above 40%. But I would like to comment that um, they will, they will go straight up. They'll go, <laughs> they'll go perpendicular. If you want to induce migration, um, if you're having trouble um, waiting for your prepupate to migrate, and often not all of them, I, I think what I uh, understand is only about 40% of them self-harvest. And the others, you know, would just um, probably turn into the um, pupate and turn into the fly without self-harvesting. If you're trying to induce um, more migration, you can uh, increase the moisture and heat. So this is how I um, increase moisture with this. Um, this is a four-foot protopod. And this happens to be a four-foot um, children's wading pool. So I just cover our bin and that increases the moisture. Uh, you know, I do add some water sometimes too, just with a watering can. And you can also add heat. So this image shows um, a bin sitting on a heat mat. This is a type of heat mat that we use in greenhouses. And I probably have it set at about, uh, I don't know, uh, it looks like I've got it set at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, in this case, the, I had a, a huge migration of the pre-pupa and they didn't wait to climb the ramp, they just went straight up. This type of rim on the protopod is, is a nice rim to, they just fall back in, they, they really don't escape from that. What I'd like to talk about though is what I believe is a more efficient way to raise black soldier fly larvae, which is the larval batch production instead of continuous. And that's actually, one nice thing about seeing the large scale production grow in the US is now you can buy eggs. And the eggs are extremely expensive. Um, this is probably about 30 grams of eggs right here. They generally cost about uh, 20, $25 per gram. So they're very expensive, um, but um, don't cost very much to ship. They're, they're very light. One gram, according to Symptom Company, has uh, about 37,000 eggs in it. So I consider this batch production a very efficient way to raise black soldier fly larvae. And I'm, I'm really excited about this new development in the market. Um, when you hatch eggs, you do need to, um, a recommended way is to put them on a screen. They hatch in about four days. Um, you put uh, moist food scraps underneath I probably um, our food waste I probably do have some, some dog food underneath this 
um, and this is a, a very fine mesh screen sitting on a, a wire structure. So they're about three or four inches above the, the food waste. And I, I do keep it in a, a tub. This happens to be um, in my, my basement because we haven't had uh, very good places that are protected indoors to, to do year-round production at, at my university. This is my home lab, is what I call it. Um, and this is actually draw, dry sawdust surrounding it just to reduce any, um, any of the tiny little larvae once they hatch to make sure they stay in the bin. You can certainly stack these growing trays. They can be very shallow and you can do quite a bit of production. This image shows a producer that um, he likes to use these um, four foot um, plastic wading pools and um, he's growing out larvae here. They're, um, they're, they're produced in a, a shallow way. Um, this is, you know, solid um, plastic tub. Uh, there, there's no drainage here um, because he's very careful about controlling um, the moisture of the food waste that he puts in. These are some bins that I've used actually in, um, in my research. You know, just you can stack them many different ways. Um, so you can fit in uh, quite a few larvae into your growing area. Again, I would um, suggest it's important to figure out ways if you're growing them inside. Um, I've done it in my basement and you do need ventilation. I mean, it's like having a growing out a, a hog in your basement, but um, you really do need ventilation because it's quite a bit of animal mass that's, that's growing at one time. So you can stack these growing trays. The ideal temperature for raising black soldier fly larvae is about 80 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. This is centigrade. But I've found that they have very high active production down to even 50 degrees indoors. Um, you know, a lot of outdoor livestock areas, you know, if they're well ventilated or barn type areas are gonna get uh, cold. And I've actually found in my basement that, um, that down to 50 degrees um, indoors is, is fine for the larval production. I, I just put blue board, I put some type of insulation on top of the tray. So I just find it interesting that we can um, uh, you know, provide some heat, but we don't have to keep it that hot all the time. With this type of larval batch production, bedding is, is actually uh, optional. Um, because they're mainly living in, the, in their food waste, I like to use a little bit of the uh, core, the coconut husk core, because it does hold moisture. So I often do use a little bit of moist core. And then you spread food waste in a shallow manner. You don't really want to pile on the food waste because you can suffocate your, your larvae that way. So it does take about um, four to six weeks for them to grow to the pre-pupa stage with small scale production. I do think, you know, some of the larger producers um, can really push this and, and produce them much more quickly. Um, but again, um, on a farm scale, small scale, we're often dealing with some, some cooler temperatures and that's definitely gonna slow down production. This is an image that I took from the internet that shows, I think, an interesting way to stack. I personally you know, do prefer larger bins, but this is one, I think, where the instars are actually separated um, by age. So it's um, definitely an interesting way to do it. As we talk about the feedstocks that you can give your black soldier fly larvae, again, the Association of American Feed Controller officials, their definition does require feed grade. And I would encourage uh, feed grade until we know more about uh, food safety with growing black soldier fly larvae or as a poultry feed. So it's, it's not required you know, by small farmers if, if, you're, if your larvae are not entering commerce. But again, like this uh, legal definition, I do encourage that um, that producers use food grade crop residues. And this does mean um, pre-consumer -con pre food waste. Um, it could also be designer type feedstocks that might be planned to uh, influence the fatty acid 
profile of the larvae. The larvae um, do tend to be high in a saturated fat, um, lauric acid, but there might be ways to influence their fatty acid profile if you're trying to increase omega-3 fatty acids, uh, for example, by designer feedstocks. Um, I've actually used sunflower seeds for this purpose. Um, because you need to reduce any type of, of risk of um, uh, food safety concerns, I would recommend avoiding animal waste or meat. I mean, the larvae can certainly um, certainly break down animal waste and there's a lot of research that shows how they can how well they can reduce um, swine manure poultry manure and they can certainly break down meat but until we know more about food safety i do follow the american association of food controllers definition that requires using a feed grade stock for the larvae to, to enter commerce it's a good idea to pre-grind um, the feedstock that you're using and this shows you can put uh, a chippy mixer on your your drill that's something that, that will work to pre-grind and this shows a producer who's got a nice mass of food waste here you can see you know quite a lot of moisture and uh, the larvae will go through that in about um, two days they'll, they'll eat that down uh, this shows you know typically um, how many of the food scrap or food waste might look but this i think is a more uniform way of doing it. One thing about raising larvae in the batched production is that it does allow mechanical separation and harvesting before the pre-pupa stage. So there's advantages to doing this. Um, my understanding is that um, in China, actually the black soldier fly uh, larvae production is um, more advanced. And they, my understanding is that they usually do um, mechanically separate the larvae from their substrate and do this while they're actually still white, while they're still larvae, before they actually turn into the pre pupa. So, a recommendation is to harvest when the larva batch just begins to turn dark. And to harvest, um, because they're not self migrating, um, you do need to, to separate. Uh, this is some of the frass and um, shells that um, that I've had to separate with my production. Uh, you do use um, a type of screen. Uh, the type that we use in the U.S. is um, eight uh, squares, eight holes per inch. So this is a screen that's you know a little bit harder to find. You know the four holes per inch is pretty easy to find at Lowe's, but the, the eight holes per screen uh, per inch is, is a bit harder to find. Using a fan can actually uh, blow away some of the shells and make this easier to sift. Here's um, kind of like sifting compost. Um, here's a, a hand sifter that a, a producer uh, put together uh, to sift and shake at the same time. This is one that students at, at App State have built. This is again an eight um, holes per inch pipe screen and the idea is to be able to turn this crank by hand and have um, have the grass and substrate fall below and be able to harvest the larvae. On a larger scale, uh, this was built at App State as a compost sifter, but something like this with an eight hole per inch screen, I think would be effective on a larger scale. And this is a, a hand crank. Uh, she's turning the crank in this image. So you put your substrate in here and then um, have something below to collect the, uh, or that could just fall to the ground, but it's a very nice fertilizer actually. And then this is where you collect the larvae from. Um, this is a producer that uh, visited his operation and before he got bigger and you know he moved to more of a mechanical type um, vibrating screen, much like is used in um, the large composting operations, but this is his initial setup that he um, would dump his larvae and substrate here to separate out the larvae, um, again, using fans. And you can see he's in a, a covered area doing this. So these are um, some larger scale ways to, to separate the larvae from the substrate. But keep in mind, if you're doing a continuous colony production, 
the larvae are different ages. So in that sense, self-harvest is still a, a very viable way, and perhaps more viable than um, mechanical separation. You know, mechanical separation is more appropriate for the batch production. And this is our um, composting setup in, in Boone in Western North Carolina. That, uh, I mean, we do obviously do composting uh, um, garden materials. This is our on-campus facility. We, we do have a, a farm about 16 miles from campus, but this is um, our composting bins that we keep covered and pretty much like a three pallet type bin back here for our um, garden waste. We also do collect food scraps um, from food waste from the students on campus. This is the tower that we collected in and, and add a straw. Um, this is our vermiculture over here. I guess it's a little hard to tell, but we've got an in-ground um, worm bin here that's um, that's covered. And the worms, you know, we can raise them, keep them year-round because the ground doesn't freeze because they're two feet down. This is our grub bin that I have already showed a, a picture of. And this is, we can only set it up in warm weather um, for uh, continuous colony production. Otherwise, the, the larvae um, do freeze or if they can get warm enough, they, they go on it. Uh, as you uh, harvest the black soldier fly larvae or um, pre pupae, uh, you do terminate them if you want to be able to store them as a poultry feed and use them during uh, the winter time. You can terminate them by freezing them. I, I do put them in the in a freezer is how I generally terminate but you could also terminate them with boiling water. And then I do um, dehydrate uh, because I, I want to use this as a feed ingredient and want to have it available throughout the year. Also be able to measure out um, how it's delivered to the birds in a prescribed way in a, a feed ration. I'm actually trying to replace fish meal is what I'm trying to do. You can use an electric uh, dehydrator. This is um, one that we use at, at App State or you can certainly use a solar dehydrator. And um, Appalachian State does have an innovative um, sustainable technology and built environment department. They work a lot with, um, with appropriate technology. And this is a solar dehydrator that was built um, in the past and um, is still, I think, used. Uh, there's information about the Appalachian State uh, food solar dehydrator online. The hot air or the air enters through here and it heats up. This is a solar collector as it rises. And then you can, this cabinet that's attached does have multiple trays where you can dehydrate food or whatever you're, you're trying to dehydrate. Um, vents up here at the top can help control. And the advantage to using this type of solar dehydrator is that there's no direct rays of the sun because the sun can break down some of the, the vitamins in the food or feed that you're trying to dehydrate. So I think this is an exciting innovation. Uh, once you dehydrate the larvae or pre pupa, there are some um, commercial products online that you can buy on Amazon. This one is marketed as a treat for ducks and, and poultry. Uh, this is one called uh, popworms by Symptom. Um, their dehydration, or some, I don't know if there's specifically, but some of the um, large scale um, larvae producers, they, they use more of a microwave type dehydrator. And um, I think supposedly it keeps more of the nutrients. And it does, um, I think, kind of um, pop it is, is what that does. So it's a different way of dehydration than the electrical or solar dehydrator. Uh, I think it's important to look at wintertime options for countries like the U.S. that we have a lot of cold areas. And I am very interested personally in ideas for insulated larval production outside in, in cold weather. So this is an idea that I've seen that a producer has experimented with building a box, a wood box, and a cooler type of insulation inside. I think if a heat mat, like a greenhouse heat mat, were put on the bottom, I think something like that could possibly allow batch larval production year-round. 
again, without having, um, unless you have a lot of livestock housing, then it would work well in your livestock housing, you know, if you keep your livestock housing heated. Um, again, you just need, you know, quite a bit of ventilation because there's a lot of um, CO2 uh, being produced. Managing breeding adults. Um, some uh, pre-pupa can be allowed to develop as adults, and this is where you would um, incorporate an insectarium to keep your breeding adults. Uh, again, they're only alive for a few days, but um, they mate and, and lay eggs. Their mating behavior is regulated by sunlight. It's commonly said you can't do this with artificial lighting, but I have heard of, um, of people being able to do it indoors um, with artificial light. But uh, this is an image that I, and that's taken from the internet. This image too is taken from the internet that just shows uh, what the eggs look like. Um, corrugated cardboard is an inviting place for the females to lay. And I do incorporate um, corrugated cardboard strips. I just hang them above um, the production area in our colony production. My understanding is that it can be quite difficult to manage um, breeding adults. But um, I mean, uh, during the during the winter time in our temperate areas, I think it's certainly possible in warm weather. And I would actually recommend really kind of a combination of continuous colony production and batch larval production. Um, you know, in warm weather, you know, whether tropical countries or warm weather in the U.S., because you can harvest eggs regularly um, during the warm season, and you know, every four days or so, take out the um, this portable egg case here and um, hatch out. Uh, you can just put this case directly on top of a, a screen that I've mentioned on these tubs and that would allow you um, every several days to hatch out a new batch of larvae that, that are all the same age. So I actually do uh, recommend combining this. Uh, this is a lot of text here um, but what I want to point out is I think many of us are interested in feeding the larvae um, to poultry. You know, again, I'm trying to replace the use of fish meal. And that's what this investigator found um, several years ago, that they replaced, um, the black soldier fly replaced 100% of the fish meal in layer diets with no impact on egg production. Uh, this researcher more recently uh, fed the larvae in combination with plant protein, with peas or alfalfa, to slow growing organic meat chickens and found the performance to be comparable to a soybean meal control. Uh, more recently, um, there's been interesting research um, at Penn State, um, Pennsylvania State University, um, Patterson and workers, they found that increasing level of the larvae to, to laying hens um, at 12%, there was an increased um, egg specific gravity but they actually found lower albumin and hog units. And there was an impact um, of the yolk on, uh, the impact of the larvae on the yolk fatty acids. This researcher uh, working in combination uh, with this one, these researchers found uh, they separated the larvae meal, uh, they separated out the oil, and then they fed a meal too. But they found that increasing levels of oil up to 4.5% um, for laying hens led to a greater albumin height, but they found that feeding increasing levels of meal to replace the soybean meal actually led to lower egg production above 16%. So that's some of the research um, on feeding the larvae to poultry. Um, again, I've been trying to replace fish meal with black soldier fly larvae for uh, choice fed chicks, and this is a preliminary trial that I've done um, I'll describe what I mean by choice fed in, in a minute, but um, our research has been done at the Appalachian State University Sustainable Development Farm with the chickens there, um, or the poultry production area there. We hatched uh, black soldier fly eggs and I raised the larvae on to hold um, sunflower seed feedstock. And uh, this shows how um, in a colder environment, like a basement, you can actually add some um, blue board insulation um, that, and the larvae do congregate pretty heavily under the, the blue board. Um, I harvested, I terminated them in the freezer, 
um, I dehydrated them and then we ground them um, to incorporate them into our, our feeding program. We actually use an alternative feeding method at, at our SD farm, our sustainable development farm, that um, is designed around uh, ecological uh, nutrient cycling. So we try to use as many ingredients from the farm as possible that, that we can grow. Um, so we feed our energy uh, separately. You know, we do rely on separate energy and protein feeding um, and allowing the birds to, to self-select um, for their target nutrient level of, um, of protein and energy. So um, this is something I've, I've done research on in the past and, and find it an effective way of incorporating on-farm ingredients. Um, so we feed a high protein concentrate. It's also a very historical method. It's called mashing grain is the, the old name for doing this. So we feed our high protein concentrate in a separate feeder than from our corn. And our high protein concentrate we make with about 81% roasted soybeans, um, any type of plant protein, but we've, we've used um, soybeans, uh, fish meal, 9%, and that's what I'm trying to replace, oyster shell, uh, 3%, and then a common vitamin, vitamin mineral premix that's um, used by many pasture poultry producers in the U.S. So that's how we make our high protein concentrate, and we let the birds um, self-select. You know, they um, generally eat more energy in the wintertime and less in the summer. Um, I think this, uh, this method of alternative feeding does have um, good applications for organic production because you can grow your own organic corn on your farm. Organic poultry feed tends to be very expensive. So this is the alternative feeding method that we use and a feeding trial that we did was to um, feed chicks from uh, day one to 28 um, days, um, young chicks. And I'm still analyzing uh, this data but I just wanted to point out that we um, used a uh, high protein concentrate is what we call it. One, uh, the control was based on fish meal, and then our treatment was based on black soldier fly larvae. And we only had um, the ability in this trial to do a preliminary, uh, a preliminary analysis, so there's no replication of these treatments. Um, we have one treatment on this side of our this small range brooder, and one treatment on the other side, and that shows me uh, working with some students, pretty tight quarters here, um, testing out the black soldier fly high protein concentrate. Some future directions that, that we're interested in is, um, as I've mentioned, I really would like to investigate the use of small units for year-round larval production in temperate areas, especially since you can buy eggs now on the internet and hatch it out and do this year-round. Um, I'm interested, you know, we've looked at that little wood box set up. I'm interested in um, using actually a solar collector. This, again, I've mentioned that we do have a, um, a really innovative um, solar technology department here at App State. And this is a solar chicken house that a student built when I uh, first started here about eight years ago. We've used this as actually with our silky, you know, silky chicken production because it's a small unit and they're small birds. Um, this is a PV panel that um, the student installed uh, for light, but this down here is actually a solar collector to heat the unit. So the um, air enters here, this is a black background, um, and then the air is heated uh, with a black solar collector here and glass in the front, and then um, set up um, a sensor that can detect when it's less than 40 degrees inside this, and that's going to vent opens and the, the warm air goes into the chicken house. So I would really like to adapt this um, type of technology to um, prototype for, for raising larvae year round because many of us don't have, um, you know, a, a good barn to do this in, you know, um, and we want to do it year round. We're also trying to extract um, the oil because, again, black soldier fly larvae is um, is high in fat, about 35%. And we were just using the type of press here that um, people used in 
um, extract the oil from canola seeds, for example. We were not able to extract very much oil with this method. And I hope we can do some type of mechanical method or pressing because we're, we're not going to extract it with um, the chemicals. But it's, it's a really nice idea. And my understanding is that actually in many other countries, the larvae are raised more for the oil is what they're raised for. So it's a good idea to be able to separate out the oil from the, the larvae also for, for biodiesel. So uh, we've been experimenting with that. Uh, these are some of the citations um, on the slide that, that I've mentioned. And then um, I would like to acknowledge that the work was funded by a NIFA Organic Transition Program project. Uh, my final slide is resources, and um, these are some of the, the larger companies, these, these two here, um, that do sell eggs. Um, I don't have the Intera one from, from Canada. Um, uh, I don't have them listed, but they're a very interesting company. The protopod you can buy from um, this company. You can also buy the, the biopod if you're interested in it. This is the manual that's online, and it's, it's great reading about uh, black soldier fly production. My email, and then I'm happy to try to answer any questions for you. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Um, Alicia asks, could worms and fly larvae be grown in the same system? I think worms and, um, and flies end up <laughs> in the same system, but the, um, the larvae tend to be much more voracious um, than worms, so they'll eventually, um, uh, they'll eventually dominate. So I, I would recommend keeping worm population and black soldier fly population separate. Okay, um, the other one is, how many grams would you recommend to purchase to be used for treats for chickens rather than as a feed ingredient? One gram, you know, I think that's the minimum that you can, you can buy. Um, I mean, of eggs is, uh, I mean, obviously, if you just want treats, there's some um, great uh, sources um, on the internet, you know, that you can just buy the treats and you don't have to raise it up. But if you just want to do this uh, for yourself for, for treats, um, just one gram, because it makes a lot of larvae. I, I think that's the eggs. I think they're talking about the actual worms. The actual larvae? Um, I think most of the treats are sold in about a pound, is how they're sold uh, online. Right. Um, but actually, you know, more and more stores offer insects bulk you know i was recently um visiting in in arkansas where you know I, I went where i did my phd fayetteville arkansas and just one of the the local um, farm stores there sold bulk um mealworms so increasingly i think um home scale producers can actually buy uh, and it's you know very exciting market actually for producers to think about you know being able to provide local treats so chickens because chickens as y'all know adore it okay alicia clarified her question it was about the eggs uh so how much would you need to raise for a continuous production for treats not for inclusion in the diet um for treats if you're buying eggs um i mean the smallest amount that you can buy would be a gram I do think that's a bit more than just treats. So, so if you're just doing it for treats, I would recommend that you um, uh, you um, you use one of the continuous colony units. I think would, would work well for treats. And it's a little bit harder to manage. You know, how much are you going to get out of that? The protopod instruction manual says that if you put in 25 pounds of food waste, you're going to get out five pounds of larvae every day. Uh, I have a question. What do you do with the um, the decomposed material that after the larva finished? Well, the larvae they eat everything. <laughs> they don't have anything left behind that you could use as fertilizer or something. Yeah, the frass is it's great stuff. So the frass is left behind, and that's a good point, Jackie. It makes an excellent fertilizer. And actually, some of the companies. Um, I can't remember which one it is, either Enviroflight or Symptom. They sell fresh 
grass. So, you know, that's also another excellent byproduct. Okay. I think uh, it's as good as vermicompost. It's not as, as abundant, but it's, it's great stuff. Right. Uh, would livestock manure satisf satisfy as a food source for larvae or only food waste? Um, livestock manure is not food, it's not feed grade. So my recommendation, I think we all know that um, the larvae um, are often used to reduce, um, to manage livestock manure, but because um, FTA and the American Association of Feed Control Officials, they recommend feed grade, feed grade actually, I also, you know, until we know more about food safety, that's even though you're not selling this on the market, you're feeding it to animals that are uh, chickens that will be eaten by humans. Yeah, and even in the eggs, salmonella and E. coli and all sorts of other things that could be transmitted from the, the manure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that counts for egg producing animals as well. Yes, that's, anything that's got uh, manure in it is a food safety concern legally, right? Yeah. yeah. Are there any more questions? We got a few minutes. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on April 2nd at 3 p.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time. It's only supposed to be 20 minutes, an overview of poultry equipment for backyard uh, chickens. And then uh, two weeks after that is managing manure from backyard chickens. Um, so that's always a concern. What do you do with the manure in a backyard flock? So um, will there be a recorded? Of yes, this webinar is being recorded and it should be up shortly. Doesn't take very long for it to uh, convert it to the correct format for me to post. So can we invite other folks from Jamaica? To watch it, anybody can watch it. It is open to the world to watch the recording, which will be posted. Uh, I think I put the website up there. Um, it will be under the past um, webinars. And the website is poultry.extension.org. And if you uh, follow us on Facebook, I will also uh, put it there when, once it is up. So are there any other questions before we go? I think you did a great job. Um, and, and it would be really good if you could put together a little fact sheet that we could put up that summarizes uh, some of the work that you've done with uh, Black Soldier Flies. You got some really good work there. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jackie. Okay. Thank you guys for attending. Sorry for the confusion on the start time. Uh, this was, is being recorded and I will have the recording up shortly. So thank you very much.